All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us for today's alumni career webinar, Employment Gaps, How to Find Work if You've Been Out of Work for Over Six Months. My name is Jeff Murphy. I'm a member of the Career Programs Team in the Office of Alumni Relations. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Boston University Alumni Association and is offered to our 346,000 alumni around the globe and, of course, all of our current students. Throughout your career, BU is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. And we aim to do this by providing everybody with access to a series of valuable online tools and social media communities. I know we have alumni and students joining us today from some very far away places. I know we've got somebody joining us from Oman for the very first time. Um, just know that we're really thankful to have all of you joining us and for all of your support. Before I introduce today's speaker, a few housekeeping notes from me. Uh, today's presentation is being recorded and will be soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the BU Alumni Association website, which you can find at www.bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions that you may have, and you're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A function on Zoom. It's similar to the chat. You're gonna hover over your screen and you should see an option for Q&A. Just go ahead, type, uh, excuse me, click on that and you can go ahead and type in your question at any time. Um, you can also go ahead and use the chat. We'll definitely be keeping an eye on both. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day, BU Questrom School of Business alumnus, Mo Shenmugam. Mo is a former attorney turned executive coach. He's the founder of MGC Coaching, where he helps ambitious professionals create fulfilling careers and become successful leaders. He works with clients from a variety of industries, including legal tech, finance, and healthcare. His mix of personal coaching and practical strategy provides an ideal mix that helps clients gain more confidence and take the right steps to advance their careers. Prior to coaching, Mo's career included some interesting roles in marketing at Reebok, talent management at United Talent Agency, and in-house legal at Def Jam and Sony Music. Mo is an ICF certified coach and is a graduate of the Coaches Training Institute. Um, his degree from Boston University uh, was a Bachelor of Science from what was then the School of Management and, of course, is now the Questrom School of Business. Mo also holds a JD from the New England uh, School of Law in Boston. Mo, thank you so much for being here today. You have been a tremendous uh, thought leader for us over the years. You've done a ton of presentations for the alumni community. We really appreciate you being here. I'm going to go ahead. I'll get my slide deck down and then you've got a, a great slide deck of your own to share with everybody. If yeah. you want to go ahead and get that and then you'll be uh, up and running. The floor is all yours. Okay. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for that intro. Thank you to all of you, as Jeff said, for joining us today. This is a uh, um, always, you know, an, an important conversation, and, and, and I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to be here. Um, and just want to acknowledge you for being people who are here to learn and, and develop yourselves and, and develop your careers. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. So today we're going to talk about how to find work, especially when you're trying to overcome that challenge of uh, uh, being long-term unemployed. Um, so uh, as Joe said, you know, we're, we're, we want to welcome you here. We're so happy you all are here. Um, and if you could, just to make sure we, we know where everything is, go ahead and type your first name into the chat function and let us know where you're calling in from, where you're zooming in from. It's always fun to see, uh, you know, where, where everyone's uh, located. And uh, all right, we've got Scott from Miami and Paul from LA, James in Melrose, Mass. All right, I see we've got Chicago and Boulder, Colorado and Lila from Philadelphia. That's where I'm at today. Um, someone from the UK, Andy, all right, good to see you. Shari from New York, we've got Houston, Madison, Wisconsin, a lot of Boston, Massachusetts folks. Hi, Cheryl from North Carolina. Awesome, fun stuff. Janish from Taiwan, all right. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank, again, thank you all for being here. It means a lot to have you here. <clears throat> so uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Definitely, this is going to be a, a, a workshop with a lot of good notes for you to take. So get a pen and paper, get ready to take down some notes. I'm going to be asking you questions um, and have you think through some of, the, some of these uh, professional career topics. So make sure uh, you'll get a chance to, to write down some of your answers to some of my coaching questions. Stay engaged, write down any questions you have. Again, pop them in the chat. There will be a Q&A towards the end. 
Um, and if you have to jump off early, this is my email, mo at mgccoaching.com. Feel free to email me there if you need anything. So um, as Jeff mentioned, I come from a pretty diverse background. I like to say I've had three dream jobs. I've worked in the sports marketing industry for Reebok, got to work at the, in, in, in Hollywood in the film industry at United Talent Agency, where we represented some of the biggest writers and directors and actors in Hollywood, uh, everyone from um, uh, Harrison Ford to M. Night Shyamalan to Ben Stiller and Jim Carrey and people like that. Um, and then I eventually left that to go to law school to become an entertainment lawyer and, and, and got to work at Def Jam and Sony Music as an in-house attorney. Uh, you know, and I share all that to say, uh, you know, like most of you, I'm someone who's, you know, tried a few different things, worked in a few different industries. Um, as you can see, they're very different industries. So I understand the challenges of changing careers. Uh, the fears associated with that, the challenges of getting into very competitive industries like the sports and entertainment industry. And then eventually I said, hey, I I'm going to leave all that and go become an executive coach. And really my story around that is even with these great jobs that I wanted to do, I found that I was chasing a sense of um, sort of excitement and fulfillment that I wasn't really finding in any of these careers. Um, they were interesting, great jobs. I'm glad I got to do that. But at the end of the day, none of them felt, none of them gave me that fulfillment that I was looking for. And so I actually went on a, a journey to figure that out for myself. And coaching was something that really helped me. And the first time I was exposed to it, um, it really opened my eyes to how I was making decisions and, and living my life in a way where I didn't even realize how limiting I was, I was being when I was um, trying to make these decisions, especially when I was thinking about what to do next after being a lawyer. So it's very common for us to let our fears and sort of practical thinking stop us from doing the things we really wanna do. And, and coaching I found was a great tool and a great conversation to help me get out of my own way to start to see things differently and, and allowed me to take some really brave steps to, to really go after what I really wanted. Um, Coaching became the thing I wanted to do next after I was a student of it. And, and now I work with other professionals who are going through that same sort of angst and crossroads moment of trying to figure out what they want to do next after they've already achieved quite a bit. Um, and so, as you can imagine, there's a lot of fear involved with, with really going after what you want. And I find coaching to be a really great tool to help people take those brave steps in their careers. Now I work with clients, uh, you know, because of my legal background, I do work with a lot of attorneys, but since I've done so many other things, I, I work with clients across the board from various industries, consulting tech, higher ed, um, healthcare, uh, but really fundamentally what I help people do is figure out what they wanna do next and, and how, to, how, how to also become better leaders. So with that, I want to say my goal for you in today's conversation is really to give you practical and advanced job search strategies that go beyond just talking about updating your resume and having to network uh, to get you unstuck to help you land your ideal job. So here's what you learned today, how to go from chasing any job to really getting specific about what you really want. That's, that's going to be an important strategy for you to learn to go from feeling unsure about what to say, especially if you're, if you're, you know, if you are having, if you do have a long gap and you've got, you know, uh, some issues with sort of where you are in your career to, to really confidently describe what your experience is and how to talk about the gap that you're, 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 you're in right now. Um, also to go from being a traditional passive job seeker to more of a proactive professional who, who's developing their skills and building their credibility. We'll talk about more about that in this presentation. And lastly, to go from asking your network for help, which I know can sometimes feel kind of uh, sort of uh, icky and make you feel bad and, and people don't like asking for help, to really showing your value to your network in a way where they want to help you. Uh, so it's going from that, sometimes job seekers will say they feel like they're begging for a job. We don't want you doing that. We don't want you feeling that way. And some of the tools I'll share today will help you switch mindsets to go from that beggar mentality to someone who is a person of value. But let's talk about where you are today. 
you know, the common challenges I hear from, from clients who are in this long-term unemployed situation, and that's really defined as someone who's been out of work for six months or longer, which quite frankly is not a long time. Six months is not a long time to be out of work. Um, I've certainly spoken to people who, and worked with people who've been out longer, pushing 12 months to over a year. Um, and, and the challenges are, first, it feels terrible, right? It's frustrating, it's, it's, you feel sad, angry, embarrassed, and insecure. You know, those are really challenging emotions to overcome. Um, there's that stigma of being unemployed that, pe that people have to carry, whether employers see something uh, wrong with that or you see something wrong with that. Um, and because of that, you're less likely to ask for help. And there's a real loss of confidence here that uh, people are going through. And so I wanna share that to really help you all understand that these are very common feelings that, that you're going through, common challenges that you all are having. Um, and to recognize that they exist both on uh, an emotional level and the practical level. You feel bad about yourself, you, you, you take less risk, but then those, those feelings impact you in a very practical way where you, know, you might not be asking for the help, you might not be networking well, you might not be interviewing well. So it's important to recognize that these challenges are occurring on both the internal emotional level and on the practical level. And it's important to know that you're not alone in this. Many job seekers, even the ones who aren't long-term unemployed, are, are feeling the, this type of insecurity and, and having performance issues. So do me a favor, in the chat, I wanna make sure like we're talking to the right crowd here. Tell me what's coming up for you. What challenges are coming up for you? Um, you know, tell me how you're feeling about sort of, uh, you know, go, going through this uh, feeling, feeling uh, you know, unemployed, right? So like, let's, let's share in the chat so that we all know we're not going through this alone. I'm just gonna open up the chat here to, yeah, trying to get over imposter syndrome. Yep, so that, that's, a, that's a really common one. Thank you for sharing that. Ageism is a big problem as well. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, feeling lost and overwhelmed. Yeah, my, a big challenge is it's hard to stay optimistic, right? Absolutely, it's, it, it really beats down on your psyche. Some people are suffering from being overqualified, right? Like how frustrating is that? either under or overqualified, exactly. So thank you all for sharing, because it's good to see that, listen, we're not in this alone. It's been, you know, it's something that we're all kind of going through. And, and, and again, today, what we're gonna talk about is how to get past these common challenges. Feeling irrelevant, absolutely. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no low confidence in the interview process, absolutely. The stigma from being a stay-at-home mother, great. So here's the thing that we're gonna really discuss here. It's, yes, these are bad challenges and these are bad situations that people are in, um, but we still need to overcome them, right? So, so that's my hope for you is that through this process today, through this conversation, you're gonna really walk away with understanding how to get past these challenges, regardless of where you're coming from. So thank you all for uh, sharing all that. Now, I wanna use a client here. We'll call her Tracy. That's not her real name. That's not her real picture. But this is a real story of a client that I've worked with over the past year. Um, she was a, a, is an in-house lawyer. She, she lost her job due to the pandemic. And I kinda of wanna use her story to illustrate what might your experience look like as well and how to show how she overcame it and how you can apply some of the same strategies she used. So she was someone who, had spent most of her uh, adult life working in London, uh, but was from Chicago. So when the pandemic hit, she actually wanted to come home. She ended up working home from Chicago, which was fine at the time. And then uh, it came a point where uh, her company was, ca was calling her back to London. She didn't want to go. So she ended up being laid off due to the pandemic. Um, and what was tricky about that was here she is coming back to Chicago in a very senior position, uh, working in the banking industry. And, and didn't have much of a network here in the US. And her, her experience was essentially from another country. So it was hard to translate. So she was having a real hard time finding her next role. Um, and so where I'd like to start and what I'd like you to consider is whenever we're looking for this next job, if, if you're coming from a place of, I've been out of work for some time and I really just need to get this first job, one of the places I want you to focus on is leveraging your past experience. 
Now, some of you, generally, you're all either going to fall into two buckets. Some of you are so done with your past experience that you definitely want to change careers and do something different. That's fine. And, and, and we can talk about that. But most of you, I'm guessing you're going to fall into this bucket of it's going to be easier for you to get your next job by essentially doing what you've done in the past. As you can imagine, employees want to hire experienced people. If you've got experience that you can leverage, that's going to be your shortcut to your next job. If you're looking to do something totally different where you don't have that experience, that's going to be a longer job search, right? So if we are trying to really shortcut your time here of, of being unemployed, we do want to focus on almost creating your target job. And, and the way I want you to think about that is looking at your past experience, the industry that you come from, uh, the types of companies you've worked with, the job titles you've had in the past. And let's come up with a target job that you know, could look like in my, in my client Tracy's case, it was to be another in-house lawyer. Uh, she came from sort of the banking world. So it was in that industry as a banking attorney. And she very specifically worked on regulatory issues. So that was her sweet spot. And the reason why that's important is she can now focus her effort on that versus wasting her time on things she wasn't even qualified for. And I share that because a common challenge or a common mistake job seekers make is that thinking about it from their own perspective, they, 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 they tend to go for, they tend to go wide, right? They, they want to apply for whatever's out there and see what sticks. And unfortunately, from the employer's perspective, they're not hiring you just because you're applying for a job. They're looking for the most qualified person for the job. So I really want you to understand that from the employer's perspective, you want to start to think about how can I put my best foot forward? Where am I most qualified? and not how many jobs can I apply to and hope someone picks me. That's not a great strategy. So as, as I'm sharing this slide, take a, take, a, take a few seconds here to think about what are, your, what are the industries, companies, and job titles? What is your past experience? And come up with one target job that you want to apply for that you know you're most qualified for. Um, and feel free to share that in the chat as well so people can start to see what, what people are coming up with. <clears throat> I can sort of let you know that you're on the right track here. Great, a public librarian, that's very specific. Being a recruiter, a writer, I would challenge you to get a little bit more specific there. Cybersecurity, great, that's a good industry to be in, that's a hot industry. Real estate finance, okay, great. You guys are doing a good job here. In-house government paralegal, perfect. Healthcare consultant, climate policy advocate. Okay, I love the specificity that I'm seeing. So you guys are getting this concept. <clears throat> so let's let's take it let's take it a step further here. Again, the point is having a focused job search is better than a general job search. It's going to save you time, stress, anxiety, all of that. <clears throat> the question I want you to be asking from now on is how can I be the most qualified person um, rather than how can I apply to the most jobs? Let's stop doing that. That's not increasing your chances. Um, and on the off chance that you do get a job or even get an interview to a job that you're not qualified for, I would actually call that a red flag because that just means the employer is desperate to hire someone. And so, so that's not a good thing either. So let's talk about how Tracy got focused. She she got specific, again, she was based in Chicago. So that was gonna be, that was kind of like her hub of where she was looking for jobs. She also added New York and DC um, because that international com component uh, of her experience, those cities made sense. She focused on the banking and finance industries <clears throat> um, and she focused on her strengths. She knew what she was good at. She knew where her past experience was. Um, so, and that was sort of in regulatory matters and things like that, but, um, and, and, and she stopped wasting time looking at other jobs, at other types of legal jobs. Um, when we first started working together, she thought about, you know, doing some nonprofit work, uh, going to work at all kinds of uh, other things, certainly leveraging her career and her interests. But her focus was so wide that it was almost impossible for her to get any traction doing that. And so very uh, sort of organically, I, you know, I, I, I let her start that way because I just kind of wanted to see where those activities would take her. And eventually she just saw just from a practical matter, it didn't make sense to be so widespread, at least in this sort of way where 
she was she knew her unemployment was continuing to, to get longer and longer. So again, being focused is going to really help you focus your energy, focus your time, and actually get you to the end goal of being employed faster. So now let's talk about another important piece is what skills can you learn? And this is important for a few reasons. If you're unemployed, um, and 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 I can I can only imagine sort of the, the variety of unemployment that's happening for all of you on today's uh, on today's program. Um, you know, there could be just sort of a, a regular unemployment where it says you at home, you're single, you can just focus on yourself. I have clients who are dealing with family issues, health issues, financial issues, you know, everyone's challenges, there's certainly a spectrum here. So, um, but what we do want to say is when you are unemployed and, and, it's, and, and it's for a significant amount of time, employers are going to want to know what you did, you know, even, and, and even if it was around sort of, you had to take care of a sick family member or a sick child or anything like that, those are very fair things for you to say. So I don't want you to feel bad. Like that's, that's not the right answer. The right answer is what's true to you. But also if there's something you could do around developing yourself to show people what you did with this time, uh, not necessarily time off, but you know, it, you know, here you are, yeah. people want to see like, how did you better yourself if it's taking you six, 12, 18 months to get a job? Um, certainly some of the more obvious uh, options are thinking about certifications, online classes, I have clients who are doing some personal projects here. Um, but to give you sort of a high level way to think about this is uh, being a learner, being someone who's, uh, and, and not just because you have the time and you're unemployed, but even as uh, an employed professional, I work with clients who are, um, who have jobs and are, and are looking to advance their careers. One of the best things you can do is to continuously invest in yourself. I mean, just by virtue of the fact that BU has these workshops, you know, we want you attending these workshops even, even after you get a job, right? It is about you improving yourself and becoming a learner. So think about what are some of the valuable hard skills and soft skills that are relevant to, to you uh, and your employer and in, your, in the industry that you're in. So hard skills can be sort of the things around, uh, whether it's like learning a specific coding language or, or getting sort of, you know, I, I work with a lot of attorneys and accountants, so they have very like hard skills that they can learn, but also soft skills. I work with a lot of leadership development clients who need to get better at public speaking, who need to get better at developing their coaching skills, uh, these communication skills, you know, those are the soft, those fall into soft skills bucket. Um, and those are things that you want to spend some time developing as well. And so, oh, the benefit here is not just you're getting better at something, you get to show employers what you've done with your time. Um, and also, quite frankly, it gives you something to talk about. It, you know, it gives you, you know, something to, for, where you can start to feel good about yourself that you're, that you are getting better at something. So I just want to stop and give you guys a few seconds to think about what are some ways you can, what are some skills you can learn? What's something you can do to better yourself during this time? Um, and feel free to drop that in the chat here. Um, and I just want to get a sense of what, what are some ideas that are coming up for you. Finishing, I uh, finished my MS, great. So volunteering, yep, absolutely. Learning how to rebrand yourself, okay. Learning Salesforce. Toastmasters has been great. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a former Toastmaster guy, absolutely. Um, learning classroom management skills, taking a Dale Carnegie course. Joining a professional group, absolutely. Professional associations are a great place to spend your time. There's a lot of learning there. There's a lot of networking going on. Uh, that's a great idea. Learning how to publish, taking Coursera courses, seeking a mentor, absolutely. We can let, and we'll talk about that. More software skills, design strategy. Okay, great. So you guys are getting this as well. <clears throat> These are all the things that you could be spending your time on. Uh, the, and, I'm, I, and, I, and I say this, you know, knowing that we all have limited time to, to do all these extra things, but quite frankly, I don't want you to see this as optional. Even after you're employed, I want you to see this as necessary for you to advance your career. Taking LinkedIn courses, great. So this is what can help not only build your confidence and help you feel like you're sort of in the stream of professional development and you can, it puts yourself in the stream of having professional conversations with perhaps your other students, your instructors, 
and it gives you just something, it gives you something to talk about with, uh, with, with people. Excellent. So again, it's important to do this because it shows employers that you are active, that you're being active and developing yourself. They're going to want to see that. Um, it gives you new, these new skills keep you relevant. And again, it keeps you interesting. A lot of people are talking about suffering from, you know, having imposter syndrome and not feeling good enough. Um, but quite frankly, if you do these things, you get to, you get to share what you're learning. You get to share this with other people so you can give value that way. So again, it keeps you interesting and keeps you relevant um, and it helps build your confidence. So in Tracy's case, she, she really took to this. She, she was a, she, she's a lawyer. She liked to learn. She was totally open to this. So she started attending workshops and going to speaker events. Uh, she joined a women's networking group uh, for other sort of senior uh, executive women. And they always invited speakers to come in. So she was sort of keeping herself in the flow of uh, staying topical with what was going on, not, not just from a sort of legal background, but just from society background as well. She took CLE classes. And she, she let that be the thing that sort of, uh, it, also, it, it was also part of her job search experience where she wasn't just looking at job boards and updating her resume and, and sending it out, right? That's actually a pretty boring job search. So this actually made her time uh, being unemployed interesting. It gave her other ideas and other, other ideas for people to talk to. Um, and eventually through her networking and through her learning, those were some of her best opportunities came to her from. So again, you wanna think about how can you put yourself in the stream of activity where people are talking and sharing ideas? Um, and, and, and really this is actually one of the sort of the uh, secrets uh, that, uh, that I'll talk about later of the long-term unemployed is one of the worst things you can do is be by yourself and do this by yourself. And one of the best things you can do is find a group of people, find a supportive group to be around um, so that you can help each other and support each other and, and not just be a victim of your, of your own negative thoughts. Because that's where we really get in trouble is when we're alone with our negative thoughts, feeling bad about ourselves. That's a bad spiral to be in and it's hard to pull yourself out by yourself unless you have a high degree of self-awareness. Um, and plus it's just more fun to be around other people. So really take that to heart. Consider um, uh, joining some groups here. So now let's go around sort of the, 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 the other practical aspect of this is what do you say when, you, know, when, when you are in, in, a, in an interview process, you'll get some form of the tell me about yourself question. And this is where most people freeze up. You know? So when I do interview prep with people and they are, and they do come off, you know, they've been fired or they've had a long gap and they've got something scary. It feels scary to them that they need to talk about that they know is gonna be a perceived issue. Uh, part of the coaching that I do really stems around preparing in a way where, um, number one, you want to study the job description. So the mindset is here is regardless of what happened to you, the employer only cares about can you do the job? Um, or that's what they ultimately care about, right? So you need to focus your answers and your energy towards making it clear that you can do the job. That If you do that, well, some of these other things that might be a red flag could get looked, they could look past that. So number one is study the job description, know what you're applying for. And by that, I mean, uh, you know, understand what are the roles, responsibilities, what are the key words that you can then use in your answer to tell me about yourself. And after this slide, I'm going to share a, uh, a template of something to, to, to say that you can, you can take with you. Um, so study the job description, understand what the employer needs, and that gives you what to say. You only want to talk about what's relevant to that employer. Uh, so you're not going to share your 20 years of experience. You might share the relevant pieces of your 20 years for that specific job. Um, you can might you might naturally mention the gap and and sort of fill in like what and so you know during this time I've done X Y and Z. So you can sort of offer that uh, information up front um, or just in the natural flow of the conversation that might come up later. So you know be flexible with this. I don't want you to use some sort of rote script where you kind of just give a monologue of everything you've ever done and what happened to you uh, during the gap. And now let's, uh, let's jump into uh, sort of what, um, what my client Tracy had said. And I just want to quick check in here. I see there's a few things in the chat. Um, let's see. Hmm. 
Because you're going to look at requirements, no issue to follow up with him, you hear about his other workshops. Great. Uh, what if the interview is for something that doesn't have a job description? What if you get an interview through connections and there isn't a job posting that you're applying for? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so in that case, Kristen, um, it's going to be on you to really ask good questions about them. So you're almost interviewing them just as much as they're going to interview you. Because as you can imagine, I can't imagine how else you would have a productive conversation um, if, uh, if you don't know much about the job. So um, you want to adopt the mindset of you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. Um, so, so good question. Thanks for asking that. And I love that you got this opportunity through connections because that actually makes this conversation a little easier. So maybe they have some context of who you are. They might sort of see you as credible based on the mutual connections you all have. And maybe you can ask your mutual connection a little bit more about this job that you're interviewing for. They can give you some advice. So, so what I love about this that I want to highlight is when you're not just applying for a job online and going through the traditional channels and, and, and you're going through connections, you're going through your network, there's a lot more flexibility here. Um, and so that's actually good. You can use that to your advantage. Now, let's just take a look at something that um, I put together with Tracy here. So I wanted to give her some way to answer this question because here she is, she's coming from 20 years of experience working as an attorney for different law firms, working on, with different clients, doing different things, all within the banking industry. But, but really what only, what mattered about her experience, what she needed to have in her answer, tell me about yourself, um, was more about what was, what was the job description that she was applying to, right? So she was actually applying to a job um, at Coinbase to be an in-house attorney there. Coinbase is a new, is a new cryptocurrency um, startup that just was in the news a few months ago for, for their big IPO. Some of you might be familiar with that. Anyway, the point is, we, we sort of synthesized her 20 years of experience into what was relevant to Coinbase. Um, and as you can see here, we even mentioned, um, I was laid off due to the pandemic and I'm looking for my next ideal role. I'm excited about this opportunity at Coinbase because dot, dot, dot. And she went on to talk about that. So what I really want to point out here is she takes control of the narrative. She kind of glosses over the fact that she's been laid off. You could see on her resume how long it's been. So she's not offering up a bunch of detail about this terrible thing that's happened to her. She's just very, it's very sort of matter of fact and professional. If they want to ask more questions about what she did during the layoff, that's fine. But you see, she's not dwelling on the bad thing that happened. She's really focusing her answer on, on why she's excited to work about Coinbase, to work at Coinbase. And what about her experience is relevant to working at Coinbase. So I really want you to take that into, take that, take that to heart right now is, as much as this is a big deal for you, you don't have to make it a big deal in the interview process and the job search process. Really focus on the other people and what their needs are and share that part about your experience. Um, so let's, let's, uh, let's keep going here. Let's, uh, I just wanna stop and <clears throat> take a couple of questions here. We got a bunch of uh, good and unique questions here, Mo. Yeah. Do you want to just read them off and maybe we could take them? Sure. Yeah. Um, do you want to do, um, I want to make sure we, we make sure to get through all of your content. Um, so why don't we do maybe two or three and then keep Let's going? Let's do two or three. Yeah. And then we can okay. keep going. All right. So uh, let me ask you this because it's come up a couple of times. I know that your session is not specifically intended for an older audience by any means. Does anything that you have talked about or are going to talk about change for people who are older workers? Um, or would you just recommend that people maybe follow up with you after the fact to talk about the unique challenges that an older workforce face? Yeah, no, the older workforce, um, that, 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 is a, that is a real problem. Ageism is a real problem and systemic problem. And there's actually, um, I could share some resources about that um, because that's an issue that actually there's a professor in Boston, Ofer Sharon, who's like taken on that challenge of what to do there. And really one of the best practical tips he can give to, to uh, this ageism issue and for, for people who are going through that is understanding it from, 
uh, one, finding a support group to help you sort of go through that and not, and one, not go it alone. But it's a real problem that, um, that I, I think becomes very specific to everyone's situation. So for example, with clients that I've worked with, they've had to either create their own businesses or, or sort of find their own way because they're, they're, you know, they're coming up against they're too, they're too old or they're too expensive. Um, and that's where the employer's mindset gets stuck around looking at clients who are of a certain age. Um, so, th so, so part of this is understanding, well, how can we best get you to your goal and, and not just depending on the one solution being someone hiring you? We could, we could get creative around finding some other solutions there. You know, John, you've asked in the chat, you know, how about doing another session specifically for older workers? We have, and we do on a very regular basis. Uh, if you want to check out our, the alumni website, vu.edu slash alumni, go to the career webinar section. You'll see that we've done many sessions specifically for older workers um, about combating um, age discrimination. Uh, keep an eye on our calendar where it's a topic that comes up a lot and, and we cover a lot uh, and have, and there's on-demand webinars you can access. Well, we got a lot of questions about that you've already talked about, like we're still on the slide here. What do you say? Um, how do you talk about the gap? How do you talk about the gap if it's medically related? How do you talk about the gap when it was a decision that you made to focus on personal projects um, and now you're trying to get back into your industry? You know, there. This is um, this is the tough one, right? Because it's always it's never a one size fits all answer. Yeah, it's always going to be yeah. based on somebody's <laughs> unique circumstances. Uh, so can uh, what more do you say, how much left do you have to say about this specific section? Because, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, for when people have been out for a while, how, how do you, what's like your guiding principles for how people should decide for themselves what they share about their gap and what they don't? Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, this, this is a great question. And, and as you can see, it's very specific to all, you each have sort of your own unique take on what you're going through here. So for example, for some people who, you know, I see someone here has been six years out of the uh, out of his industry and is uh, taking on personal projects and looking to get back in. Great. So tell me, you know, again, if I'm an employer and I'm going to hire you, if you got to think about it from the employer side, what can you do for them? And get out of your sort of side of the story, right? If, if, if sure, yes, you've been out of you've been out of that industry for six years, but are your personal projects? what about your personal projects are going to be useful to this person, right? Tell me what you've done over the last six years that's going to make me want to hire you. And if you can't answer that question, if what you've done, if maybe you were spent the time beekeeping for the last six years and now you want to get back into IT project management, you know, maybe beekeeping isn't the thing that's going to get you that job, but then you should know enough about what you're going to get into that you can say, all right, if I want to get a job in IT management, here's what I have to do, right? I've got, I've got a gap to fill because I don't have the right skills to get into IT management. So you need to take it on yourself to go get those skills, not ask an employer to just hire you just because you want the job there. So when you're coming from a skills gap standpoint, that's your clue to go learn those skills. And, 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 and that's how you overcome that, right? We can't expect these employers to hire us just because we want to work for them. Um, we've got to take the responsibility to fill in those skills gaps. Um, you know, when it comes to medical issues and, and privacy issues, um, I, I, again, like what, what does an employer need to, sh to know about it? Is it going to impact your work performance? You know, there, there's layers to that, 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 you know, we, we would need to go through on an individual basis. Um, um, yeah, but, you know, as you can see, these, these kind of get sticky when, when, they're, when, when, when they're complicated. And I don't want to, I don't want to spoil the nice surprise, but like, you know, this is, uh, Mo, you've been super generous with your time always. And I know that you're going to make yourself available to folks today. And this is a, these unique circumstances are an excellent time to engage a professional and trained coach such as Mo here. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, well, yeah, Mo, yeah. We've got, uh, we still have some great questions, but I think um, our best bet is for you to keep going and, and we'll see these for the end. Yeah, perfect. All right. Um, so yeah, the big picture here of tell me about yourself is I want you to take control of your narrative. Don't again, don't focus on the bad thing that's happened. I've been out of work for six years or whatever the case may be. 
you need to focus on what does the employer need to hear? And if, if, if you're starting from the beginning here, if you're starting from, I don't have enough experience or I don't have the right experience, then my coaching to you is how can you get that experience? What can you do from a class perspective, certification perspective, uh, volunteer, personal project perspective to make yourself marketable? Um, the other piece is, uh, is, you know, if you've been fired, if you have something, if you have this gap, don't over explain or paint a depressing picture. Don't get too sort of into the weeds about what's happened. Um, I, I, you know, I help my clients practice saying what's happened in a way that's, you know, short and matter of fact. We work on the tone. We make sure that you can deliver the answer um, where it's not going to be seen as a red flag. You know, again, they want to know you can do the job. And so if, if that's what we focus on, that's going to give you your best chances of moving forward with this employer. Um, and certainly, you know, you want to have something here to share what you did to improve about yourself and how you spent your time. That's why we're talking about, you know, taking the time to develop some new skills. So again, take control of your narrative. Employers care about what you can do for them. Now, uh, jumping into sort of getting into the job search piece, the traditional job search approach, um, I see as someone who's taking a very passive and unfocused approach. It's the send and wait, you know, send out a bunch of resumes and wait. It's, it's the spray and pray approach. You know, <laughs> I'll apply to a bunch of jobs out there and, and, and pray someone picks me. And it's a random act of networking. Uh, so look, yes, you have to apply for jobs. You have to network. You know, the, it's, it's good to apply to a lot of jobs versus only a few jobs, but you want to have some strategy around this. And so that's what we're going to talk about next is being a proactive professional. So part of being a proactive professional is doing what you all are doing today. You know, coming to a talk like this, getting the information you need, um, and, and sort of to reiterate what I said earlier, it's focus on what you can control. So, you know, don't spread yourself too thin, get, get specific and focus on, on the right jobs for you. Yes, you need to apply and network. Um, and that's a whole other sort of presentation I can do about how to do that the right way. So it's not about just applying to whatever's out there or just networking and asking people for a job. They're very specific tools and, and strategies on how to network better. Uh, being specific about what you want. Uh, when you are going out and, and networking, at least in the beginning, you don't necessarily want to go out and ask for a job, but it's helpful to ask for advice. And, and the reason why I like to give that analogy here is uh, for people to, who avoid networking, a lot of the reasons why they avoid networking is they don't like asking for help. They don't want to ask a stranger for a job. They don't want to ask their friends for, for help, um, especially if they haven't spoken to their network in a while. It doesn't feel good to ask for something when, when you haven't given. And so one way to get around this is at the beginning of a job search process, you don't necessarily know um, everything about the job you're applying for. So it's not like you just kind of want to ask someone for a job at their company or, hey, can you help me get a job here? You actually want to collect some information. So as a proactive professional, you want to do your due diligence on what it's like to work at this company. So for my client, uh, Tracy here, uh, using the Coinbase example, she didn't just ask someone for a job at Coinbase. She started talking to other attorneys at Coinbase, one, because she was interested in the company, but two, she wanted to learn what it was like to work there. So her conversations were focused on uh, learning from them. She was asking them about their experience. She wasn't asking these strangers to give her a chance to you know, give her a leg up in the job application process. They didn't even know her. So that would have been inappropriate. So when you take this learning approach, it takes the pressure off of you to sound like a perfect candidate um, and also, you're not asking someone for a job, which is kind of a heavy lift. But if you're just asking for advice, that's something that people can freely give you. And, and most people are happy to have that conversation. So network, that's one of my favorite strategies for networking. The other thing about being a proactive professional is, what are you learning? Listen, whether you're unemployed or employed, I hope you are investing time to learn and improve yourself. Um, and those, that gives you opportunities to give back and it, it lets you feel valuable, right? So be a person of value, whether, especially if you're unemployed right now. Uh, if you're unemployed, it has nothing to do with your value. I, I, I consider myself, I, I'm self-employed right now. I, I have to find clients every day. I'm hustling for a job every day. And so I need to be a person of value um, in order for me to get the clients that I need. Uh, you know, and even just by virtue of me being in front of you right now, it's because of a post I made on LinkedIn that Jeff, Jeff, Jeff liked. And he said, hey, Mo, this would actually make for a good 
top topic, right? So here we are now and I get this great professional opportunity, but it's because I, I was being a person of value. I was sharing some relevant information that Jeff thought was useful. Um, this next slide here is an outreach template that you can use on LinkedIn. Uh, whenever you send a, a connection request to someone, I don't like it when someone just sends me a connection request with no context. Um, so I, 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 I like saying, hey, here's why I'm reaching out to you. Um, and I look forward to connecting. So here's sort of a, a brief template you can use to say, hey, you know, you would introduce yourself, let them know who you are. You know, I'm a, I'm a paralegal, I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I'm an accountant, whatever that case may be. And I'm starting to explore new career opportunities. So you're being very upfront right there. Um, but you're not asking this person for a job. You go further here. It says, I'm interested in blank in what you do. I came across your profile. It stood out to me because of blank. I'd appreciate connecting to learn more about your experience. That's a very sort of safe, easy way to approach someone um, where you are sharing the context of why you're reaching out and what you want from them. I would say when you do reach out to people on LinkedIn, um, especially strangers, you want to expect about a 10 to 30% response rate. So this isn't going to work with everyone. It's not a silver bullet. It's not going to get, it's not going to open every single door for you. Uh, so, you know, know that there's about a 10 to 30% response rate. And so don't let that discourage you, but just know that that's, that's how this process works. Um, just checking the chat here. Well, speaking of the chat, Mo, I, um, I couldn't resist the temptation. One of the favorite webinars um, that I've helped facilitate, you actually did. It was how to write a networking email that people will actually respond to. Yeah. Uh, and so I just put a link to that in the chat. It literally, you were just, you know, used the example yeah. that you had on the screen there. I think that's an that's awesome way for people to see another <laughs> one of the sessions you've done for BU alumni. So I, I did put that link in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so again, moving forward, as, as we talk about being a proactive professional, what I hope you're taking away is here, you, you, part of this is you controlling your thoughts, beliefs, and actions, right? So whatever question you're having about what to do next, that's just where we're starting from. So think about, you know, to be a proactive professional, ask yourself, what do you want to learn? Who can you help? What value can you provide? And I just want to pause there and see... What, what are some ideas that are coming for people around this idea of being a proactive professional? Like thinking about where you are today, what can you do to, to help someone else? Where can you be a person of value? Maybe drop some ideas in the chat. And I just wanna share an example here of what I do on LinkedIn, which I, which I hope you all use and, 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 and will use after this program here to really, um, yeah, James mentioned how to write successful grant applications. Absolutely, that's a very valuable skill that a lot of people wanna learn and get better at. Um, I, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. I pretty much use it exclusively to run my business, to market myself, to grow my business. And, and these are some of the posts, you know, so I took the fact that I was giving this talk uh, and a few days ago, I shared this post on LinkedIn, uh, you know, within 24 hours, I've got, you know, 13 likes, 433 views. And what's it, what, a few things I want to point out here that why this is useful is, um, you, you know, with the people that did like it, you know, a big question I get, especially around networking is, uh, you know, when I do network, how do I stay in touch with the people that I've networked with? Um, LinkedIn is one of the great ways to do that. So, you know, share what you're learning, share what, what information you have that um, is going to be relevant to people in your industry and in your profession. And as you do that, you're going to notice that people pay attention to that stuff. I get, I get clients all the time. And some of the things that, that they'll mention is, hey, Mo, like I've been following your stuff for a while and I knew I needed to reach out to you. And these are people who may have never liked my stuff or engaged with my, with my content. Um, but people are paying attention. People are taking this all in. And it's because I put myself out there that I'm getting some, some good feedback um, in return. So I really encourage you to, again, whether you're employed or unemployed, use LinkedIn as a tool to give to the community that you care about. Talk about the topics that are relevant to the people in your, in your industry. Um, this is one way you can stay top of mind with your network so that they don't forget about you. And it also, when it comes time for you to make an ask, 
you don't feel so bad about making that ask because you've probably been in conversation with people throughout these times. Um, again, that's one of the biggest hangups for people when it comes to networking is they haven't given to anyone in a long time. And so now they feel bad asking for help. And that's a really um, sort of bad uh, habit to develop. You should be in the habit of helping others um, so, that, so that it comes back to you as well. Um, and so if you're not doing that, think about ways you can start to just give and offer help to others, especially if you're unemployed, right? This, this becomes almost mandatory for you. It's like, how can you be a person of value? Think about that instead of worrying about, you know, what can you get from other people, wanting other people to help you start with being a person of value. And I promise you, that's going to change your confidence level. Um, here's actually one of my clients who, who, you know, who's doing what I teach is um, he's, he's looking at really focus on transitioning his career into the transportation industry. So he's actually employed. He doesn't work in the transportation industry, but some, some of what he does is sort of attached to that. And so what he does is he'll take a relevant article to the transportation industry. He puts in you know, his little context of, hey, this is a great program coming up. He's tagging specific organizations um, and he's just showing his enthusiasm for the project. What's great about this is now the people who like it and share it and comment on it are all people that are either in his network or he's being introduced to new people. And this invites a conversation with him that otherwise he wouldn't be having. Um, and so this is a very organic way to, to not only elevate your brand, provide value, but you're building credibility with an audience that you eventually you know, want to, to, to work for. Uh, so, so really keep that in mind. How can you be useful starting today? And LinkedIn is a great platform for you to do that. So the idea here is learn to build credibility and show your value. So here's how Tracy did that. She, she got proactive. She was focused in her search. Again, she, she, was, she, she was really networking well with, and getting warm introductions and talking to people. A lot of those conversations didn't go anywhere. A good handful did. She started getting interviews, uh, first, second, third, final round interviews. She was taking her CLE classes. She was using LinkedIn the way I taught her to use it. She volunteered with her, her law school in Chicago to really start to build that network in Chicago. Um, and she stayed active with them, you know? And eventually she actually landed her job at Coinbase and it wasn't the first job. She actually applied, got to the final round and didn't get the job, but they liked her so much because she had a good attitude. She had a positive attitude. She had so much to share because she'd learned so much about their specific niche of cryptocurrency that they wanted to find a job for her. And they knew that the first job wasn't right for her. She knew she wasn't right for that first job, but they liked her so much that they actually invited her in for another job and said, hey, you should apply to this job. She eventually got that job. So I shared that to say after, and, and this was after 12 months of being unemployed, but she stayed, she stayed active. She stayed, um, uh, she stayed focused on what she wanted. And I always ask my clients at the end of having worked with them, after giving them the strategies, the templates, here's exactly what to say. I, I always like to ask them, what, what's, what, you know, what, what advice would you give your, yourself, your, your earlier self that started this process? And it never fails to be this sort of, sort of almost cliche advice, but it really comes down to, you know, be persistent, don't give up and stay positive, right? She doesn't, she's not, you notice she's not talking about the, the, the outreach templates I gave her. She's not talking about, uh, you know, some of the more specific strategies I gave her. She's talking about like what really, what she really took away from this process is how much her attitude and beliefs really helped her stay the course, right? Because this is not an easy course, right? There, this is a hard process, you know, expect it to be difficult. Um, don't expect it to be easy, but, but despite that, you, you, and, and this is not about staying positive all the time. She certainly had her down moments and, and, you know, that's why it's helpful to have a coach in your corner to really have someone to talk through things with you. And so, you know, part of what I'll say here is what I think is super valuable, whether you work with a coach or not, be around other people, you know, create a group, a, a job search club, get like two, three, four, five friends here so that you're not alone. It's important to have people supporting you, you supporting them. Uh, you know, you can give resume feedback, interview prep, you can share contacts, share introductions. It, but it's so important to have someone be in your corner through the emotional ups and downs of this process 
Otherwise, you could, it, can, it could really take much longer. And left to our own devices, we can really spin downward into a really dark place. Um, and it's important to have all the people to help us snap out of that and see the, see the good sides about us and who we are, right? Because it's easy to sort of get caught up in the I'm not good enough conversation, the I'll never get a job conversation. So you, so you really want to be around other people who can tell you to stop focusing on that, stop talking about that, right? And focus on, well, what can you do, right? What can you get better at? Who do you need to talk to? What's one thing you can do today to really snap you out of, out of, out of the, the emotional impact of being long-term unemployed? And of course, you can build in that accountability as well. So in conclusion, um, get focused, leverage your past experience, be a learner, take control of your narrative, show your value, uh, find a supportive group and don't let, don't, don't, you know, don't be alone with your negative thoughts. And so I know we've got like a minute left here, but take a second to think about what's one thing you learned today that you'll take action on. Um, so I jumped to the gun here and um, share that in the chat. And Jeff, I'll, uh, I'll go. I, I really dislike LinkedIn. Well, Kristen, yes, it is a necessary evil. <laughs> um, but for anyone that wants to go a little further with me, I'm offering a free uh, 25 minute coaching consult. You can email me at mo at MGC coaching. Um, and, uh, and also, if, for those who do sign up for the free coaching consult, you get a copy of today's slides as well. But some takeaways I'm seeing today is don't be alone with your thoughts, increase your value, uh, pay more attention to LinkedIn, learn new skills, get focused. Awesome, awesome. You guys, you guys did great. You guys did great today. I appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate you investing in yourself. This is something you could talk about on LinkedIn, share with your network what you learned today um, that would be helpful for people who are long-term unemployed, uh, who are just you know, thinking about how to develop their uh, careers. Um, oh, this is an connect, connect with me on LinkedIn. This is an incredible offer that you're you're making everybody. And again, you know, people ask some really great questions, but are just super unique to their own circumstances. And so mm -hmm. the fact that you're giving them a chance to to follow up with you to to talk through the specifics of that, um, it's really an amazing thing that you're doing for the community. So thank you very much. Um, we do have a couple outstanding questions. Yeah, I'm yeah. good to roll over for a few minutes here. Do you have a hard stop at one mode? Do you have something? No, I've got time. Do you, do, you mind, or do you mind going over for a few minutes? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I know people might have to go and that's totally okay. I promise I won't be insulted, but let's let's try to get through these questions. Um, and Mo, as you're probably seeing here, a lot of people weighing into the chat just with thanks and, and letting you know how much they appreciate yeah, this, uh, this time here. Um, we got a, a, a number of questions about cover letters. And that's like, um, all right. I find the, the whole topic of cover letters so interesting and 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 wonder your take on it and, and how it might have the importance this might have changed over the years because you know what you're saying is here to is not just focus on like the application it's all the stuff you do before the application that's really going to count but mm -hmm. can you would you mind just kind of sharing like your thought your general thoughts on cover letters and what people need to make sure are in them to make sure that they are valuable tools as part of the process yeah yeah so you know cover letters and resumes um I, I, the one thing I like to stress there is make it relevant to the employer and not about you. So I'll, you know, a common mistake I'll see is someone say, hey, Mo, can you review my cover letter? Um, I have this sort of general one that I wrote. And in my head, I'm like, how can you write it? Like, are you just writing about yourself just because you want to hear yourself talk? Like, I don't care that you've done 20 years of experience in, as an attorney doing X, Y, and Z that shouldn't be your cover letter. It shouldn't be just sort of, sort of a chronological biography of everything you've done. Um, it should really only matter if uh, you should really, look, again, look at the job description, understand what it is you're applying for, what skills they want, what responsibilities they want. And then you tailor your cover letter to answer those questions. Because the question you're fundamentally answering is your cover letter is, hey, I see you're looking to hire someone who can uh, you know, write grants for nonprofits. Great. Here's my experience writing grants for nonprofits. Or even if you're coming from a different career path and you haven't done that specific thing, tell me what you have done that's similar. You know, uh, I come from an accounting background where we had to write applications for the government to get blah, 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 you know, like something like that. So really, you should always be strategic about what you want to say in your cover letter 
and the job description gives you sort of the topic to focus on and talk about. The same thing with the resume. I mean, Joanne's specifically yeah. asking, do I need to tweak my resume for each job I apply to? You do, but not like the whole thing. So the way I write resumes is there's a top section, you know, you get your name, contact info. And I like to have a little summary, a three to five sentence summary of who you are. And that summary is where, because because recruiters read that resume, they scan it really quick. They're reading it top to bottom. And so you got to catch their attention in, right there at the top. So you're going to want to say in that three to five sentence summary of who you are, who you are in relation to the job you're applying for. Like I just spoke to someone who had been working in, uh, you know, branding and marketing, uh, uh, but she was also sort of a franchise owner of a 7-Eleven. And here she was, she now wanted to get go in-house and do branding and marketing for Dunkin' Donuts, let's just say. Well, if you start with, I've, I've, I'm a franchise owner with 10 years experience owning a business, you lost me. I don't, I don't want to read that resume anymore because you're not the person I'm looking for. So she needed to start with, I'm a, I'm a branding and marketing professional with over 10 years of, uh, you know, developing branding campaigns and marketing campaigns. Oh, now I'm interested. And later on, I can see how she connects as a franchisee owner. I had to develop branding and marketing campaigns for these, for these products, right? So now she's talking about her experience in a way that's relevant to the job, but really it's only the, the top piece you, can, you need to tailor because otherwise your experience is your experience. There's not much you can change there. There might be a few tweaks to make, but you're not completely overhauling your entire resume every time. Yeah. Um, Min, Min, you asked a question really early on in this webinar about finding the balance of what you love and when to start working on retirement. I'm not sure I totally understand what your question is. So if you wouldn't mind, maybe um, if you're still with us, if you uh, would maybe just elaborate on what you exactly wanted to ask Mo. Um, we also, Mo, got several questions about references and about... Um, Explore, I'll combine questions from Christina and James. How, if you're somebody that struggles to come up with recent references um, or just, you know, you don't have a ton of people that you can, you know, showcase as, as people who can testify to your experience and skills, how do, you, how do you explain that situation? And again, I realize that can be individual. Yeah, that's tough. Cause you know, you know, generally people will reach back to either, you know, professors or old bosses or colleagues. Those, those are pretty much the pool of people that will come up as, as references uh, that you can use. Um, and if you can't, whether it's, you know, maybe if, if this is a young professional who doesn't have a lot of work experience or someone's a senior who does, but doesn't have those relationships, um, yeah, I, we'd have to sort of sit down and talk through, well, like, because I, I, I think as a coach, I would push them to say, well, let's, let's, what does that really mean, right? Like, who, who have you worked with? Let's talk through that list of people. Yeah. It might be just a fear of asking. Right. But, or, you know, is it time to go out and find a volunt a regular volunteer opportunity where you can develop somebody that you could use as a reference, you know? Suggestion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Andy asked a really great question. You know, you mentioned uh, you're getting out there networking, and, and specifically relating to asking for advice and not asking for a job, mm -hmm. would you recommend that Andy, you know, she's, she's wondering if she should get out there and offer her skills as a freelancer. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you recommend people do to build experience and, uh, and, you know, instead of just getting out there asking for a job that did she sort of make that offer? Yeah, absolutely. That, I mean, the fact that you can do that, that's a really creative way to, um, to, again, yeah, make yourself valuable. And if that's something that appeals to whoever you're offering that to, that's that's a great idea, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, Mo, again, a lot of people here in the chat just weighing in with thanks. Um, Kristen specifically mentioned your positivity and that's something that you and I actually touched on before thinking about this topic is really heavy. You know, we had a lot of people that signed up for this today and yeah. we were wondering if this was, you know, a reflection of the economy with so many people having had a terrible 2020, so many people losing jobs, being underemployed, but you did. I mean, you really did put a positive spin on this and, and, and everything that you've done for BU. And I just, again, I can't tell you how much we appreciate everything that you've done for BU over the years and specifically for everybody who's here today so um thank you so much yeah no th thank you thank you jeff i always appreciate 
even having the opportunity to do this. And, 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 and so I, I, I'm very grateful. Thank you. We spent a lot of time today talking about LinkedIn, and I've always agreed 100% with everything that you've ever said about LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to make sure that folks know about BU Connects. Uh, we launched this year a brand new networking and pl mentoring platform that is private and just for members of the BU community. You can find it at buconnects.com. Um, in this specific case, I might tell you to think of it like a, a LinkedIn with training wheels, a great place to test out a lot of the stuff that Mo talked about today, um, to connect with a community, try, you know, talking about your experience, talking about the things that you value. One of the great things about BU Connects is you can specifically find people who have raised their hand and said that they're willing to help um, open doors at their network, talk to you about your experience and your resume, um, and specifically also say that they're willing to serve as a mentor. We, we talked about the importance of continuing to learn and being a learner, and you can find a mentor right on buconnects.com. The other funny thing about LinkedIn, if you're already on LinkedIn, you can save some time and set up your BU Connects profile in minutes by signing in with your LinkedIn credentials. So another reason to get on LinkedIn if you haven't already. So um, again, buconnects.com. I can't recommend it enough. Make sure you get on there. You can start networking today. So thank you again, everybody. But again, thank you again so much, Mo. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you all for showing up today. Have a great day or a great evening, wherever you might be. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.